Today I want to look at a pretty interesting question and this arose while I was teaching my topology class and we were looking at something called a Cauchy sequence. And that question is how do we know if a sequence converges without being able to guess its limit? And so before we really tackle this question I'd like to look at what it means for a sequence to converge using a careful like real analysis type definition. So by definition, we say that the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n equals l if for every epsilon bigger than zero there is a natural number n such that if little n is bigger than or equal to that capital N, we have a n minus l is less than epsilon. Okay, so there's a lot going on there, but if we unpack this a little bit at a time, we want to think about this epsilon as being a very, very small number. And what this is saying is that we can find a place in the sequence, that place is capital N, for which every element of this sequence past that point is very, very close to our limiting value. But I'd like to look at this definition in light of our question and notice that in order to check if something converges using the definition, we in fact need to know what the limit is. Well, sometimes it's easy to guess the limit, but other times maybe we're working with a sequence that converges to a brand new constant and that constant hasn't been defined yet. Well, how do we know that the sequence converges so that we can define the constant in terms of that sequence? Well, we'll get to that, but I wanna like do a little bit of a shortcut for the purpose of this video so we don't go through all of this mucking about with epsilons and deltas. And so let's say we know some examples of, or so let's say we know some, what I'll call basic examples of sequences that tend towards zero as n tends towards infinity. So maybe that's like one over n or one over n squared. Those clearly go towards zero as n gets larger and larger and larger. Then in order to show this limit, all we have to do is show the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n minus l equals zero. And so let's look at an example of that. So let's show that the limit as n goes to infinity of 3n plus 1 over 2n minus 5 is 3 halves. And in order to do that, we'll look at the corresponding limit hinted by this action up here. Of course, this would be a theorem that you would have to prove. But after proving this theorem that the convergence of this to 0 is equivalent to the convergence of this to L, then armed with some basic examples of sequences that go off towards 0, you're good to go. Okay, so anyway, let's get to it. So I'm going to take this term right here and subtract the limiting term. So I've got 3n plus 1 over 2n minus 5. And from that, I am subtracting 3 halves. Okay, so let's notice I left myself a little bit of room there. And that's because I want to give myself a common denominator. And so the common denominator is clearly just the product of those two denominators as they're relatively prime. So that means we'll multiply this first term by 2 over 2 and we'll multiply this second term by 2n minus 5 over 2n minus 5. Okay, let's see what that leaves us with. Now we have the limit as n approaches infinity of, so this is going to be 6n plus 2 for this first term, and then over, let's see, 4n minus 10. So 4n minus 10, but I'm going to kind of put that in the middle because now I'll multiply this negative 3 through to the numerator of this second term. So let's see, negative 3 multiplied onto that gives us negative 6n. And then on to the next one we'll have plus, let's see, that is 15. Okay, but now we get some simplification. Notice that these 6n's most definitely cancel. And then we have the limit as n goes to infinity of 17 over 4n minus 10. But I think this fits into a basic example of a sequence that tends towards zero. So notice our numerator is a constant, whereas the denominator is getting larger and larger and larger and larger and larger. Thus, the whole thing is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So using this tool up here, we've shown that this limit is 3 halves.
Okay, so now on to the main question. So now let's tackle this problem of convergent sequences when perhaps we don't know the limiting value. And this statement is true in the real numbers. It's not even true in the rational numbers. What you need is a so-called complete metric space. Okay, a sequence, which we'll call an, converges if and only if for all epsilon bigger than zero, there's a natural number capital N, such that for all M and N bigger than or equal to that N, AM minus AN is less than epsilon. And in general, this is known as a Cauchy sequence. So in the real numbers, a Cauchy sequence is exactly the same thing as a convergent sequence. But in the rational numbers, that's not true. And our example will actually point that out. So what's the idea here? Well, again, epsilon is thought of to be a very, very small number. And then this capital N is thought of as being a very, very large number. And this says that the difference between any two terms of this sequence if you're way, way out in the sequence, is very, very small. Okay, so let's maybe look at a shortcut. And this shortcut is maybe similar to the shortcut that we said before. And it really allows us to do this kind of calculation without worrying about epsilons and stuff. And so we can show for all M and N bigger than or equal to capital N, we have the limit as capital N goes to infinity of their difference. So A sub M minus A sub N is equal to zero. And for our example, we'll look at the sum as K goes from one to infinity of one over K factorial. And we'll show that this converges but of course, since we're talking about sequences, we wanna talk about this in terms of the limit of the partial sums. So our sequence, a sub n, will be the sum as k goes from one to n of one over k factorial. And we'll show this converges using this test over here, which makes no mention of its convergent value. Okay, so let's get to it. So we'll do some exploratory calculation. And that exploratory calculation will be to take the difference between AM and AN. And maybe without loss of generality, let's assume that M is bigger than N. Well, I guess we could put a bigger than or equal to there, but it's not so interesting when they're equal. And, and that's because if M is bigger than N, then in this case, the absolute values are not required because this is an increasing sequence. Okay, so let's get to it. So now if we look at AM minus AN, that'll be equal to the sum as K goes from one to M of one over K factorial minus the sum as K equals one to N of one over K factorial. But that's taking the first M terms and subtracting the first N terms. But since M is bigger than N, that's gonna leave us with all of the terms between the nth term and the mth term. So let's say we've got one over N plus one factorial. That's the first term that's available in this first sum, but not in the second. We've subtracted off everything in the second. And then the next thing will be one over n plus two factorial plus all the way up to one over m factorial. Oh, and then while we're at it, we'll say m is bigger than n, which is bigger than capital N. Maybe we should put a bigger than or equal to capital N here. Okay, nice. But now notice by the behavior of factorials, we can factor out a greatest common factor out of the denominator here, which turns out to be one over n plus one factorial. So I think that's pretty clearly a greatest common factor. And then we'll be left with the number one plus one over n plus two plus one over n plus two times n plus three. So that's what we get for n plus two factorial with n plus one factorial divided out. This is n plus three factorial with n plus one factorial divided out and so on and so forth. And then let's see, up at this very top term, we'll have m times m minus one all the way down to n plus two. Okay, nice. And now here's where we start doing some inequalities. So I'm gonna replace every factor in a denominator here with n plus two. 
So starting with this replacement right here, so I'll take this n plus three and I'll replace it with n plus two. In the next term, I'll take n plus three and n plus four, replace them both with n plus two. And then likewise, I'll take all of these terms and also replace them with n plus two. Now, of course, that doesn't give us something that's the same. It gives us something that is larger. It's larger because we're making each of these denominators smaller. Okay, so this is gonna be less than or equal to one over n plus one factorial. We can like leave that out front, if you will. And then we'll have one plus one over n plus two plus one over n plus two quantity squared plus one over n plus two quantity cubed. That's the next term. And then finally at the end, we'll have one over n plus two. And then what's the exponent there? Well, we're starting at n plus two and we're ending at m. So I think that's pretty clearly m minus n minus one. So we're left with something like that. Okay, so now let's maybe take this data to the top and then we'll finish it off. So I think there was a bit of a typo on the last board. We're looking for the convergence of this series, which is the sum as k goes from one to infinity of one over k factorial. But since we're talking about sequences in this video, we put it in terms of the sequence of partial sums. So there, there was a weird out of place equality, but I think that's okay. So we're looking at this a sub n, which is the sequence of partial sums. Now, of course, the limit of this sequence of partial sums will be the value of this series. But again, we wanna show that this series and thus this sequence of partial sums converges without speaking at all about its value. Because we wanna think that, well, we don't know what the value of this sequence and thus series is. Maybe we're coming up with a new constant. Of course, we know this adds up to a fairly famous constant, but we'll get there. Okay, so in the last board, we ended with the following. If M is bigger than N, which is bigger than capital N, we have this difference occurring. So AM minus AN is one over N plus, that should be one factorial. And then I gathered the rest of that stuff up into a sum. So I've got the sum as K goes from zero to M minus N minus one, and then one over N plus two, all raised to the K power. Okay, so now where might we go from here? Well, notice in terms of the sum, n is a constant. And so this is simply a finite geometric series and it converges. And if it were an infinite geometric series, it would definitely converge because the common ratio is less than one. Well, how about we make it an infinite geometric series? Well, if we're adding up finitely many terms and we like increase that to adding up infinitely many terms, we'll have an inequality, but the inequality will go in the same direction. So instead of rewriting that with infinity, I'll just erase this right here and put an infinity. And that's totally okay because we have an inequality at work here. Okay, but now we can use the summation rule for a geometric series. And then let's see what we get. So this is gonna be one over n plus one factorial. We have equality at the moment. And then the starting term, which is one over one minus the common ratio, which the common ratio in this setup is n plus two. Okay, so let's get to some simplification. So let's maybe multiply the numerator and the denominator by n plus two. I'll put my n plus two right here in the numerator. And then there's my n plus two in the denominator. Okay, that leaves me with n plus two over n plus one factorial. And then that's multiplied by one over n plus two minus one. That's what happens when we distribute that. Oh, but now this n plus two minus one is very simply just n plus one. Okay, so now let's take this and rearrange it a little bit. So I'll have an n plus two in the numerator. And in the denominator, I have an n plus one times an n plus one factorial. Okay, but now let's notice that n plus two over n plus one is always less than two. Notice that it's exactly equal to two when n is zero, 
But since n is bigger than zero, that means that this is always less than two. So we can build an inequality into this. This is less than or equal to two over n plus one factorial. Okay, but then in turn, that's gonna be less than or equal to simply two over n. We might as well keep it simple. That's because n plus one factorial is most definitely bigger than n. So when you take the reciprocal, you definitely get the inequality in that direction. Oh, but let's look at this. This n is bigger than this capital N, which means this is all less than two over capital N. But now we can go at it. Notice that the limit as capital N goes to infinity of a sub M minus a sub N, on the one hand, that's bigger than zero. Maybe I should say bigger than or equal to zero here because you can pick up an inequality in the limit. As That's because you can pick up an equals in the limit. That's because we assumed that M was bigger than N, so that is always like positive. Okay, anyway, so now this is gonna be less than or equal to the limit as capital N goes to infinity of this term, two over capital N. So this may seem weird because these indices are these lowercase m and n, but those in essence depended on capital N. They had to be larger than capital N. Oh, but I think this is one of our well-known sequences that goes off towards zero. So we have this is zero. So let's see. In the end, we've used the squeeze theorem. We've bound this limit between zero and zero, which means the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub m minus a sub n equals zero. Which, what does that tell us? That tells us that our sequence converges by, well, essentially this idea, but using our limit version of it that we described on the last board. Oh, but what does that mean? That means that this sum as k goes from one to infinity of one over k factorial also converges. So we showed this converges without discussing its value at all. And that was really the whole idea, was to determine if a sequence converged without guessing its limit or without knowing its limit. Notice we didn't use anything about its limiting value here. Of course, we know it's E, Euler's famous number. Well, let's suppose that number hadn't been defined yet. Well, since it converges and it's sort of a nice aesthetic sum, it would be logical to give it a name. And I think this is likely how named constants come into existence. They're described to be limits of sequences or series that perhaps don't converge to other known constants. And that's a good place to stop.